you. Um, and I first of all I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, so David Richardson and Katie Morancic from the Oceans and Climate Branch here at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, and Tim White from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And so why are we talking about plankton as forage on the Northeast U.S. shelf? Um, and so this work has spun off of a larger uh, project that the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and collaborators do, which is providing state of the ecosystem uh, information to fisheries managers. Um, this information provides fisheries and ec uh, ecological objectives information. So for example, what the seafood production, uh, recreational opportunities, and how managed protected species are doing within the ecosystem. And as we've seen over the years, uh, the Northeast shelf ecosystem is experiencing a lot of change due to climate um, and a lot of change due to uh, to uh, human impacts and human uses. And so on the, uh, we've been asked to provide information on what the forage of the ecosystem is. Um, so previous research has shown that mesozooplankton is highly correlated to fisheries production and in large marine ecosystems. And on the Northeast US shelf in particular, changes in fish recruitment and production and changes in fish condition have been shown to be linked to copepod abundance. At the same time, communities and life stages are exhibiting differential ecological responses to shifts in the Northeast U.S. shelf ecosystem. Uh, phytoplankton, fish, and macroinvertebrate are showing different distribution shifts. And then uh, among life stages for adult and fish larvae, um, distribution shifts have been shown to be out of sync. So why are we interested in uh, frankenplankton? So the goal of this research was to calculate an annual plankton forage anomaly for three ecological production units, which are reported on in the State of the Ecosystem reports. We have the Gulf of Maine, Georges Bank, and Mid-Atlantic by ecological production units that are used uh, to present to the management councils. And also, uh, food web analysis of the shelf has shown that plankton is an important food source and also research on the, the plankton community has shown that our, our plankton community is fairly diverse and a number of our predators are generalists um, eating um, a lot of different types of taxa. And then finally, we wanted to consider the diet of, of all the important ecosystem characters, so macroinvertebrates, fish, whales, and seabirds. So if we look at our methods, our data comes from uh, the Ecosystem Monitoring Program, which is a stratified random sampling program, which samples four to six times per year in our strata cover from off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, all the way up into the Gulf of Maine. And we sample 47 uh, strata with 60 centimeter bongo toes, which sample the entire um, water column from the surface down to within five meters of the bottom or a maximum of 200 meters in depth. From those samples, we uh, sort, identify, and count all the ichthyoplankton and zooplankton taxa to the lowest possible level. And so for our plankton forage analysis, we looked at uh, 29 annual abundancies for our three ecological production units. On our graphs over here on our top panel, we have our zooplankton abundance shown here on our y-axis and our x-axis for both panels is our year. So going from here, we're going from 2000 to 2019. Um, the top panel again is zooplankton annual abundance for the Northeast US shelf. The bottom panel is our ichthyoplankton abundance. And then all of our lines represent our 29 taxa that were chosen as as um, from diet analysis and diet studies. Um, our dominant zooplankton taxa within the Northeast US shelf, uh, this solid or this thick blue line up the top is Calanus finmarcticus. And then the uh, thick yellow line below that is our small calanoid copepods. And these are in general less than 1.6 millimeters in chromosome length. Down in our ichthyoplankton plot down here, um, it's a little messier, but we do have some dominant taxa. Some years we see um, 
Sam Lance in this purple line here dominates in the ecosystem. Other years are managed Scorpions, which are Atlantic Herring and Atlantic Menhaden, um, shown here in this red line, are very important. And then uh, the Hakes, Europeisis Hakes, Red Hakes, Spotted Hakes, and White Hakes, shown here in this black line, are dominant. And then we also have Atlantic Cod, Haddock, and Pollock. And then finally, this red other red line here is uh, our managed and unmanaged flounder, where we have a lot of different genera within that category. So our methods for calculating our frankenplankton. So on our our uh, graph over here, our bar graph, our, our uh, the blue bars show our seven plankton and zooplankton anomalies that we calculated. Uh, the y-axis is abundance again of the Northeast U.S. shelf. So for zooplankton, we looked, we ca we calculated seven anomalies: large copepods, small copepods, krill, mycids, amphipods, pteropods, and gelatinous zooplankton. And then for our ichthyoplankton, we have our orange bars over here, and we calculated five ichthyoplankton anomalies: uh, small pelagics, small demersals, gadiforms, pelagics, and flounders. And then from those, we took a mean of those twelve plankton anomalies to get a a uh, frankenplankton forage anomaly for the northeast U.S. shelf, or excuse me, for the three ecological production units. And then we just looked at some correlation coefficients among the ecological production units and also among the plankton classifications to see how that these uh, 12 anomalies related to a single forage anomaly. So our results looking at correlations of our zoo and ichthyoplankton anomalies to the frankenplankton anomaly. So on this bar plot, the x-axis again is showing our annual abundance, but this time we've broken out our three ecological production units. So our green bars are Gulf of Maine EPU, the orange bars are our Georges Bank EPU, and the blue bars are our, our Mid-Atlantic Bite. And uh, you can see that all individual zooplankton and ichthyoplankton anomalies um, were significantly correlated in at, least, and in at least one EPU. So if the bar is filled in, that means it was that individual, for example, this one flounders, the top one, individual flounders was significantly correlated to the overall forage plankton anomaly in uh, all three EPUs. So all 12 of our anomalies were correlated in at least, in at least one EPU, and then six of our um, anomalies, flounders, gadiforms, small demersals, gelatinous zooplankton, small copepods, and lar large copepods were correlated to our single forage anomaly in all three EPUs. Um, we're still trying to figure out, you know, this is a work in progress, so we're working on what this, exactly this means, but it looks like in general, our, 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 our forage anomaly does capture the overall plankton forage abundance. And again, if we look at, um, if we just take the mean of our seven zooplankton, which are shown here in the blue line, and our a mean of our ichthyoplankton trends anomalies shown here in the orange line, and then our single forage anomaly shown in the black line, and then on the on our y-axis here, we again have, or excuse me, on our x-axis, we have year going from 2000 to 2019. Our y-axis is our mean, or is our, excuse me, our forage anomaly. And then uh, you can see that our, our trends in our, both our zooplankton and ichthyoplankton anomalies follow those of our overall forage anomaly or our frankenplankton. So results for our ecological production anomalies over here on our three panels. The top panel is showing our Gulf of Maine, represented by the green dots. The middle panel is George's Bank, represented by our orange dots. And then the bottom panel is our mid-Atlantic bite, shown in with the blue dots. The dots represent the average of our 12 individual anomalies, so our forage anomaly. The error bars represent the standard error around that anomaly. And then again, we're going from 2000 to 2019, and uh, 
zero line is shown here as a solid gray line. Um, we just ran a cubic spline through our to look for trends, and the R squareds are shown for the for those uh, for the uh, polynomial of those those splines. And we can see so in George's or excuse me in the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank, uh, we had declining and negative anomalies of our forage during the early 2000s, and then since about 2009 to 2010, we've seen that the, the anomalies in both of those um, have become positive. And these two, or excuse me, these two ecological production units, these trends are correlated with a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.48 and a p-value of less than 0.04. In the Mid-Atlantic Bight, we see there was no real trend early in the 2000s. We were following along that uh, that zero um, line, and then since 2009, our anomalies show no trend again, but and have become highly variable. And then the Mid-Atlantic Bight was not correlated to the Georges Bank or Gulf of Maine EPUs. So some conclusions from this uh, early work are that trends in mesozooplankton and ichthyoplankton abundance were similar, and we did were able to calculate a plankton forage anomaly. <laughs> and then, so again, we have our panel over here is again showing our Gulf of Maine and Georges Bank um, frankenplankton abundance trends, and they were they're similar to trends shown in the upper trophic levels. Um, so one of those is fish condition of New England fisheries management stocks, um, which had, were in lower condition in 2001 to 2010. So that's represented by uh, fish of a given length were um, had low weights, and then since 2012, fish of that same length have been increasing in weight so they're um, becoming uh, uh, better in their condition has increased since 2012 and both and that trend follows both the plankton forage in the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's Bank regions so some of our next steps in this are to look at plankton forage hotspots in the ecosystem so again looking at those 29 29 tax, so 13 of which are zooplankton and 16 of which are ichthyoplankton, and look for where do forage aggregations persist in space and through time, looking at taxa specific hotspots. And for this graph here, we've summed uh, hotspots for five minutes. So, um, we're annual sums, so we lack a species or a taxa specific seasonal patterns. But we do see that there are um, a number of hot spots that are highest on the mid shelf of the Mid Atlantic Bight, um, and then the, in the Georges Bank and Gulf of Maine regions, there tend to be lower hot spots, so lower number of tacks are making up these abundant spots. But we do see um, where the western Gulf of Maine and the Maine Coastal Current are a little bit brighter than in the central Gulf of Maine, and then Georges Bank is a little bit um, brighter than anywhere around it. And so the next steps are to, again, link this back to the state of the ecosystem and provide ecosystem scale information for fisheries managers. And so some of the work we need to do on that are look for relationships to our environment. So what are these hotspots, these forage locations doing in relation to water temperature and salinity and other physical and atmospheric conditions in the ecosystem? And look for relationships to upper trophic levels. Um, so, what are our forage hotspots look like compared to fish and macroinvertebrates? And then also, what do they look like compared to marine mammals, sea turtles, and seabirds? And so, here's an example of where we've combined uh, our plankton forage hotspots with forage hotspots for marine mammals, sea turtles, and seabirds. And again, you can see that the Mid Atlantic Bight is pretty bright, but then other areas in the Gulf of Maine have become um, even increased hotspots. So where we have hotspots of forage also over appear to overlap with hotspots in birds and seabirds and marine mammal foraging. And then look at these um, how these relate to changes which will be due to changes in climate and human use. 
And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, our crew staff from our ecosystem survey branch and our oceans and climate who provide uh, a lot of the effort and sampling um, that goes on within the shelf, uh, the NOAA ship officers and crew that are um, provide the vessel opportunity to us, and then also our state of the ecosystem contributors who have uh, provided a lot of discussion and back and forth on um, this work. And as I said, this is a work in progress, so you can send comments and suggestions to me at my harvey.walsh at noaa.gov, and if there's time, I'll take questions. <laughs>